I'm talking to Maria Albertson, who's the founder of Counselors Together UK, which is the largest counselors campaigning group in the UK. Um, and you, you were created to challenge the culture of unpaid work in our professions, but the group has really evolved to include a lot more than that. Do you want to say more? It has, yeah. So the group started in July 2017 and um, it started after I met up with a friend in Newcastle for a cover and um, she's a qualified therapist as well and um, I'd met up with her because she was really struggling financially and she had found that she was having to use a food bank to feed her that young family um, and we were talking about kind of the struggles of being a counsellor, like the financial struggles that come with that. And I had went away quite incensed by this and I went on to the Counselors Connect Facebook group and I think it was a Friday evening and I had a bit of a rant like you do and I didn't expect many people to kind of comment on that and I just said how this that that's what had happened that day and how upset I was by that and then before I knew it there was almost 300 comments from different counsellors wow. um, saying how they were struggling financially and um, finding it difficult to find work and um, the theme which is talked about quite a lot is how the um, membership bodies and accreditation play into that and how councillors become stuck in this kind of cycle um, of having to work voluntary for several years mm -hmm. before they acknowledge for jobs and things. Um, and I hadn't realised, although I'd been a councillor since I qualified in 2005, I hadn't realised how, you know, it was such a big problem it was. Um, and then we got our hands on the BACP members employment survey which was done in 2014 um, and I was a member of BACP but I can't remember seeing that survey and um, so it was 2017 when I found that and that was quite shocking and we learned from that that it was um, I think it was 52% of councillors earned less than £10,000 a year mm. And there was only 9% of councillors earned more than £30,000 a year. And some of the figures in that were really shocking. And um, so I, this conversation continued in the group. And I just said, shall we make a smaller group just to talk about this more? And that's all I thought it would be. And then today we're at almost 8,000 members. <laughs> and um, it's kind of, it's, it's really blew up. So, yeah. And, sorry, go on. No, I was going to say, so we have the, the Facebook group um, where we kind of support a lot of our members um, in various different ways, really. So we have the group where people can drop in and access support. Um, but then we have um, monthly co-working meetings where people can come on Zoom and we'll have more of a one-to-one -one, um, chat with people there. Um, and then we have probably... In, in any month, we have about 60,000 interactions with members in some way or another. So that might be email, um, messages via Facebook, either the group or the page on Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, so we have anywhere between 40 to 60,000 interactions per month. That's extraordinary. Quite That's massive, extraordinary. really. So considering we're a very focused group you, you know I would expect that in a group where it was you know a more generic group and they were dealing with lots of things but considering we're very focused that's quite quite a lot yeah. of interaction so it is yeah. and I think CT UK is quite unique you're not a union um no. you're not a support group I mean how would you describe what makes CT UK different yeah, we keep being asked to be those things. We keep being asked to um, kind of evolve into a union or a membership body, but we're not going to. And we, I would say that we are a campaign slash pressure group. Um, and it's important to me that we stay that way because I think we have a lot more freedom. And I think that's one of the things that makes us quite successful um, is we can react to things quite quickly. Um, we are led by our members, although I found at C2K, I've never really felt like I'm in charge of the group. It's it's more, got a more of a kind of cooperative feel to it. Mm. Most decisions that we make, we'll ask group members for their approval before we kind of go ahead with them. And when we plan our campaign work for the year ahead, we always show that to the group and we listen to people's kind of opinions. And if they want any changes making, we'll, we'll make them. Um, so I think what that's enabled us to do, which is quite different to a lot of groups, is that we 
were quite able to hold a lot of people, we were able to kind of manage the diversity in the group and those differences of opinion. And, and I think that's because people feel like it's their group, like it belongs to them and they are listened to and heard. Um, mm. yeah. That they don't have to fight for space, they don't have to fight to be heard. No. Oh, it's very grassroots. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's really important to people because I think one of the things, um, that people have been saying over the last couple of years is that they don't feel listened to by the membership bodies and, and this has come from scoped as well that's been a massive thing and people not mm. feeling listened mm. so i think it's been really important that people who have been actively seeking out that space where they they will kind of be heard yeah, yeah. um yeah so i think the group c2k is really accessible to a lot of people um yeah, it's easy to find us, it's easy to join, and we have quite a set, a, a solid set of rules, and, and bound within that, we're quite, quite open, really. So, so your style of leadership uh, feels quite different. You're not a figurehead per se. How would you describe your style of leadership? someone said to me the other day that I lead from the back and at first I was like thinking is that an insult because I'd never heard before but then someone said someone famous done that it was like Martin Luther King or something so I, thought, I was like I'll take that <laughs> so, <laughs> I, don't know how I, describe it, I don't really feel like a leader to be honest like I know that I kind of that I am in a way because I do lead the campaign works and, and, and mm. I do kind of go out there and I speak to people on behalf of the group mm a lot of people in the group do look to me for kind of guidance and and things um but i don't know i i guess i just see myself as as one of the group as well like i am part of the group like i don't feel bigger than the group if that makes yes sense. yes like it, we it feels as, it feels as if you give people room to get on with things so you know the the I don't know what to call them, co-conspirators, your staff. What's the right way to describe the people that you work with? So the, ad, well, we just say we're all admin, really. Right, admin. Yeah, yeah. That feels very flat in the hierarchy, you know, it doesn't feel as if you're ruling from above. But neither are you just saying, oh, tiddly pom, get on with it. You know, that you're some sort of guiding principle. Mm -hmm. So we're very... Um... Yeah, so the admin team, um, so there's myself, Tara and Glenna, and we all have our kind of specific roles in what we do, but I try to make sure that we all kind of take some responsibility for something that we're doing. So for example, mm. Tara is project manager for a couple of our campaigns, and then Glenna will kind of oversee the social media, and I guess I just trust that they know what they're doing and they'll do it. You know, I don't yeah. think that I have to kind of you know, keep check on what's happening or, or what they're doing all of the time. So it's... Yeah, they very much have their own flavour. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But that's what makes us who we are. And I think when our members see that, like they then feel more able to just bring what they want mm. to bring as well. So, mm. um, yeah, so we have, um, we try to respond to members' needs as much as we can. That's another thing um, in thinking, you know, because I don't know all the answers to, to what members want or what, what we need to do. So, for example, um, the we asked members what they wanted to do in terms of um, promotion for the counselling services. And they're the ones who came up with the PSA campaign that we're doing. So right. that's professional standards um, authority, because we have members that go across all the different membership bodies. Mm -hmm. So. UK can't just promote BSAP or NCS or the ACC. We have to promote them all. Um, and I think where our group is really different is that there's, there's a lot of respect there for each other, regardless of mm. which organisation we belong to. And then yeah. as an admin team, we've been able to kind of identify ways in, what we can, in which we can promote everyone rather than just one. Yeah, group. that's that's a huge difference. You don't have to advertise. No, and and yeah. the campaign um, has been something that every member can get behind. Mm. You know, um, it promotes us all. Mm -hmm. So mm. I think that's what what makes us successful as well. 
Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about National Councillors Day? I do. I love National Councillors Day. Um, so National Councillors Day started in 2019. So it's only been going two years. It's the third conference in June. Um, on so June the 19th, Saturday, June the 19th is our third conference. Um, and what I realised quite quickly when I set up C2 UK was that the public are not really aware of what we do. There was two problems. Mm. Firstly, the public weren't really aware of what councillors do um, generally. Um, and then on the other hand, there wasn't really that space that we've just been talking about where everybody can come together from all these different places and, and kind of meet. Um, so National Councillors Day to me has got two clear aims. And the first one is to just raise awareness of the counselling profession and what we do. So we put a lot of um, work into promoting um, counselling, what it is. We do kind of myth busting things and we do interviews with our counsellors and we post them on social media leading up to National Counsellors Day. And this is all for the public because to me, if we're going to make any big changes and we need the public on our side, mm -hmm. well, and that starts with kind of educating them about what, what we do. Um, and the other one was to create this space to bring councillors together, but not in, in the sense of the spaces that already exist. Part of the problem and why there is a lack of change in our profession is because people avoid having difficult conversations about things that really matter. So we wanted to create a space where these conversations could happen. Um, so the first conference two years ago was about the future of therapy, and it was a lot to do um, with, we talked about like IAPT and social justice and responsibility. Last year, the whole theme was about social justice. Um, and then this year, it's about intersectionality and um, diversity and inclusion. And mm. within that, we talk we're talking about like finance, um, class, racism, sexism, all those things, those difficult conversations that, that are not being had, uh, had in that yeah. space. Um, but, and it's worked quite well, I think, because we have, kind of set up in the way that we have, those spaces have felt quite safe as well. Although saying that, last year's conference, there was a lot of racism that came out in the chat room as well um, during one of the presentations. Um, but instead of kind of running away from that, we just thought, right, how can we address that? Like we've all got to work together. And although there was some racism that came out from councillors in the um, Zoom chat, we just thought, right, well, what can we do? So we decided like next year, we really need to focus on diversity and inclusion and we need to look at racism more. Yeah. Um, and also it's a non-for-profit, a not-for-profit thing. So we, the money that we do make from National Councils Day goes back to councillors and not just to C to UK either. It goes back to councillors from, from anywhere. They don't have to be a member of C to UK. And um, what we plan to do mm -hmm. is put a programme together um, to, to look at to work, what we're going to do is work with other councillors to identify what's missing in training in terms of diversity and inclusion and work on putting a programme mm. together that can fill those gaps. So that's how the money will be put back into it. Um, yeah. Yeah. This leads on quite nicely to mm. your model of person centred activism. Yeah. Are you able to screen share? Yes. That? There it is. Can you see it? Yep, there it, is. there it is. So when we're talking about um, these difficult conversations, mm -hmm. uh, and I imagine every councillor is now all too comfort uh, uncomfortable with these explosive debates. Mm -hmm. They're not even debates, these explosive encounters. What you're developing here, this model of person-centred activism, offers one way through that. And I know it's not entirely involved, uh, evolved. it's not a, a fixed thing, but you want to talk us through your values and principles, the way that you want conversations to go. Yeah, so we often get asked at C2K, people will say to us, um, you know, you're quite a new organisation, how have you been so successful? Like, how, how did you campaign? How do you plan it? And we sat down as an admin team and thought about this and actually it just comes back to being person-centered we're all person-centered therapists in the in the admin team and most of our group or i would say most of our members um 
certainly, um, you know, a lot of um, the members who the paid for members as well, who have, who have had some input into this are. So to us, there was this kind of like three main parts to our campaign. Um, the first part, which we put in the middle about the relationship in, with self and others mm -hmm. um, is, is there because we, you're always campaigning in relation to something, do you know what I mean? Or someone or an organisation or a group. And even if you don't agree with what they're doing or, you know, your values or principles don't align with theirs, you still have to form some kind of relationship with them if you go into yeah. kind of some kind of change to happen. Um, and so it's a bit like, so we called it the person-centred model of activism and it's not person-centred counselling. What we do is we draw on person-centred theory and bring that into our activism work. The, 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 um, so what we then look at is these kind of, these seven things, if you like, these seven points. Um, so the first thing we look at, um, so sorry, after that bit, there's two parts. We think what the first thing before we can even begin to campaign is to really look at ourselves, because what I found um, certainly for, for myself and for CTUK is that we can't really change anything unless we've kind of done a degree of self-exploration before mm -hmm. in that. Um, and the reason I think that is because activism is like bloody hard work. It's really draining and it's exhausting. It's, 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 yes. it's hard to keep going and it's so easy to become lost in all of the noise that's happening out there. And, mm -hmm. and so the first part of this, where we look at points one, two and three, are really about kind of exploring um, why we're even doing what we're doing, like why we're so bothered about it, why we want to change. Um, and when we say for, for self or others, it's because there's always like a degree of, you know, selfishness to it. You know, you're campaigning about something because it's important to you or it affects your life or those mm -hmm. close to you and who you care for. Um, but there's also other people in, involved in that as well. We're campaigning as a group um and i just think like if you can get you know that that kind of settled or that kind of clear in your own mind you're campaigning with more clarity and it just gives you a stronger sense of kind of who you are and why you're doing what you're doing and mm. and, and you feel more grounded within that so if you do then get lost which most people do when when they're campaigning because there's so much going on you can come back to that and just be reminded of yes doing it um and that all helps us to build up that relationship with the, the people who were campaigning either with or for or against you know um because mm. there will be people in each camp there'll be people campaigning with you you'll be campaigning against something and you'll be campaigning for something mm. as well and you need to build up relationships across all of those three mm. things mm. Mm. Does that makes sense it makes really good sense and it's I remember being taught about um, the way that things get done is you have terrorists and you have negotiators. Mm. And it sounds as if you are on the side of negotiation. And, you know, there are, there are, there's room for, we need the people to put pressure on too, but you're coming from a place of negotiation, mm. firm negotiation, you know, not waffling, mm. but uh, you've got a foundation in why you're doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think as well, like it actually, like some people might look at this this model and think, oh, them first three things are quite, I don't know, airy fairy or something in terms of campaigning and being strategic. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you do have a really strong sense of yourself, I think that actually makes you stronger in your campaign mm -hmm. work. You know, you can keep your feet on the floor um, whilst everyone else is getting lost with things. Um, yes. And and yeah, and then. So from that, um, I think it helps kind of build up respect for what you're doing as well, because people can look at you and your campaigns and they can see that you're actually bothered about the bigger picture. Like it's not just mm. about you, you know, you're bothered about about how, it's affect, how things are affecting other people. Um, so, for example, in our PSA campaign, when we worked through this, um, we looked at, you know, if you look at the values and principles and... Um, so we have members in CQK from all the different membership bodies. And it was really important that we kind of showed care to everyone and we respected everyone, regardless of what membership body they belong mm. to. Also, under the others and shared, it's, it's a bit more than that. It's like you're accepting their experiences, their culture and their choices 
you know, and um, yeah. and I think that enables people to feel really included in your work as well and be more likely to kind of come along and and support you. So, mm. Mm. And looking at these values and principles, they, they're they familiar. They're in a number of our um, ethical uh, frameworks mm -hmm. and they're, they're very common to person-centred work. And, you know, they go right back, I think, to some of our early, uh, earliest written work, people like Janet Tollen and yeah. Cotton yeah. and... So that's where we um, kind of drew inspiration from this from. Um, so I'm a person-centred counsellor, our admin team or a lot of the people who had input into this are. And we think kind of, well, person-centred, it's about like being human as well, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So it's about embracing those kind of human qualities. Um, and so they will be reflected of some of the kind of ethical frameworks or the codes of kind of practice that people work towards as well. But there are also, um, you know, you just mentioned Janet, Janet Toll and I was reading one of her books recently and a lot of this stuff, you know, about client autonomy is included in their very, you know, the mm. introductory chapters of their, of their, of their work. So for us, it's been about drawing on that theory and um, so it's a bit like taking the stuff that, you know, works in therapy that kind of creates and kind of nourishes that relationship and taking that and using that to underpin how you campaign. Mm. So that it kind of, mm. you know, it, it holds. And because what, what we're essentially doing is creating a frame, aren't we? So this, yeah. this, is, this is our frame and that's, that's quite holding for people. Yes, yeah. It holds the campaigners and it holds the campaign. Yeah. And in some sense, it holds the people that you are, people or the situations that you're trying to alter yeah. also. Yeah, mm. yeah. And I think, um, you know, you, you used, what words did you use earlier about the negotiators and terrorists? And mm. to me, it's a lot about being diplomatic as well. Mm. Um, so, you know, about, you know, I think... You can often, when you look at the the other persons or the you know the the even if it's so different to yours, if you're able to kind of you know get past your own kind of stuff to look at that, you can actually like learn stuff about yourself and your own campaign and reflection to that as well. So it's about like leaving all that open as well. Mm -hmm. So if you're not in agreement with someone else, you can still learn from them and it can still influence your campaign and how you move forward. No, absolutely. And I like the word diplomatic because there's a great degree in, of skill in diplomacy. Mm -hmm. It is strategic. It's not just being nice. And I think sometimes people who aren't person-centered therapists think person-centered work is wishy-washy and, oh, wouldn't it be nice if everything was nice? But actually, it's quite mm -hmm. strategic. It, it is. We're doing what we do because it works. Yeah. And it gives you a very robust frame. Mm within um, and it's not wishy-washy at all but I, I totally get that people say that and I think that's why I said you know a lot of people will look at this and think oh what's that it's a bit airy I think I use the words airy fairy mm -hmm. it's not you know what what can be more grounding than having a really good sense of who you are and why you're doing what you're doing you know like yes. for me that's that's like putting the foundations in place so that you can move through the rest of this this cycle this model you know because without that it's more easy for that frame to break and to fall fall apart and then you're left with nothing really um very much so and i mean we, we are seeing polarization just take over not just the therapy world but all around us people are polarizing yeah. it's either or all the time yeah this poses a different way of doing things yeah yeah and um and i think that's what makes us different as well as we've managed to avoid kind of getting sucked into that mm. uh, that way of working um, and again coming back to this model that's because we do stick to that model so we are very clear and grounded and focused on what on what we are doing um, and I think you know what you're talking about there that polarization it scares a lot of people and a lot of people are scared to speak up and to actually get involved in campaign work yeah. and activism mm. anymore um which is such a shame, really, isn't it? That it is. It is. Maria, we've got to gently draw to a close. There's so much more that I, I want to say. There's so much more that needs to be said. But this mm -hmm. has been a great 
uh, introduction to this model. Is there anything that we haven't spoken about that we should? Um, no, I'll just quickly say about this model. So um, the, the next kind of points four to seven are quite, you know, um, this is where we get really strategic. And we at C2 UK, we use Google Docs and we'll have like a, a column for each each process to work through. So we'll after we've done that initial work on ourselves and the group, we'll then look at what our aims are, our objectives, how we meet it. And it's a very kind of solid plan of action that mm -hmm. we work through. Um, and the only thing I want to say about it is if anybody is interested in using this model, then this is just a very quick screenshot of, you know, the kind of very basics of it. I have written a chapter on each of the seven points um, and I will be putting all that on the website so people can download it and use it if they want to. If it's not their cup of tea, then that's fine. But if people kind of, you know, see this and, it, you know, it feels right to them, then I'd be quite happy for other people to, to use it as well. Great. So we can find you on Twitter and Facebook. Yes. Yeah, so LinkedIn. <laughs> Twitter's just Maria Albertson. And then the main um, C2UK website is um, ukcouncillors.co.uk. Um, and you'll be able to get all the contact details for myself or any of the other admin from there as well. So, That's fantastic. Yeah. Thanks so much, Maria. Thank you for having me. It's been good to share this. So. Thank you very much indeed.